Hello, hi, how are you guys doing? Um, today I am going to talk to you about eSports, this rapidly growing phenomenon of people playing competitive video games for money and other people, like millions of people, watching them online and uh, at enormous live events and giant cheering, cheering crowds at, uh, at big stadiums. And I, I guess I'm going to try to convince you that eSports has something valuable to tell us about Games for Change, about how games can uh, f be a force of progress and a way to make the world a better place. Um, but first, I want to talk about basketball. So um, in his famous essay, The Heresy of Zone Defense, uh, Dave Hickey describes this famous shot. It's in the third quarter, the fifth game of the 1980 NBA Finals, Lakers versus 76ers. Maurice Cheeks is bringing the ball up the court for the Sixers. He snaps the rock off to Julius Irving, and Julius is driving to the basket from the right side against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, Julius takes the ball in one hand and elevates, leaves the floor. Kareem goes up to block his path, arms above his head. Julius ducks, passes under Kareem's outside arm, and then under the backboard. He looks like he's flying out of bounds, but no. Somehow, Irving turns his body in the air, reaches back under the backboard from behind, and lays the ball up into the basket from the left side. When Irving makes this shot, I rise into the air and hang there for an instant, held aloft by sympathetic magic. When I return to Earth, everybody in the room is screaming, I gotta see the replay. So they replay it, and there it is again. Jesus, what an amazing play. Just the celestial athleticism of it. It's stunning, but the tenacity and purposefulness of it, the fluid stream of instantaneous micro decisions that go into Irving's completing it, well, it just breaks your heart. It's everything you want to do by way of finishing under pressure, beyond the point of no return faced with adversity, and I'm still amazed when I think of it. In retrospect, however, I am less intrigued by the play itself than by the joy attendant upon Irving's making it, because it was well nigh universal. Everyone who cares about basketball knows this play, has seen it replayed a thousand times and marveled at it. Everyone who writes about basketball has written about it. At the time, the crowd went completely berserk. Even Kareem, after the game, remarked that he would pay to see Dr. J make that play against someone else. Kareem's remark clouds the issues, however, because the play was just as much his as it was Irving's, since it was Kareem's perfect defense that made Irving's instantaneous, pluperfect response to it both necessary and possible. Thus the joy, because everyone behaved perfectly, eloquently, with mutual respect, and something magic happened. Thus the joy at the triumph of civil society in an act that was clearly the product of talent and will accommodating itself to liberating rules. Because such joys as are attendant upon Julius Irving's play require civilizing rules that attenuate violence and defer death. They require rules that translate the pain of violent conflict into the pleasures of disputation, into the excitements of politics, the delights of rhetorical art and competitive sport. Now, as um, Hickey points out in this amazing essay, uh, basketball didn't just emerge as a, as a part of folk culture. Basketball was actually designed by someone, by this guy, James Nysmith. And he invented basketball in 1891. And, and Nysmith was a Christian who studied theology. He became an unordained minister, and um, much to the chagrin of some of his more conservative religious instructors, Nysmith believed that sport could be integrated into a devoted spiritual life. And that's what he was interested in. The original rules for basketball reflect not just his good game design instincts, but also values of nonviolence, self-determination, and the power of cooperation. When Nysmith created basketball to give the rambunctious delinquents of Springfield, Massachusetts something good to play during the winter, he was, 
in a way, making a game for change. And this game has gone on to have a huge impact on the world, transforming American culture, deeply affecting the lives of entire generations of people, changing history. Now, it changed history in all kinds of complicated ways that are not always necessarily good, but I would argue that basketball's impact on the world is net positive by an immense margin. Dave Hickey's essay is actually part of a tradition of smart people writing about sports and illuminating subtle layers of meaning there, showing how games that seem to be purely abstract, mere recreation with no ostensible theme or deliberate expressive purpose, can in fact have complex aesthetic, philosophical, and political dimensions. A tradition that includes Joyce Carol Oates on the sublime terror of boxing, uh, David Foster Wallace on the existential beauty of tennis, C.L.R. James on cricket as both an unparalleled art form and a powerful weapon of post-colonial liberation. So this is the tradition that I would like to bring to bear on esports. But first, I think I should probably explain a bit more about what esports are and demonstrate that they are, in fact, similar enough to basketball and these other physical sports to deserve to inherit this tradition. So, what are esports? Well, esports are, are competitive video games that are played by expert players for large audiences of spectators online and at live events. Now, the scene has been percolating for over 20 years, really, but it's in the past few years that it started to take off in an amazing way. It's become a huge worldwide phenomenon, and it, that is due in a part to the breakout success of this game, League of Legends. So here is the finals of the 2013 World Championship for League of Legends. So this was held at the Staples Center in LA. I'm there, I'm, you can see right on the right side, I think three, three rows up. Um, there was a $2 million prize pool. Uh, there was a sellout crowd of 11,000 fans. There were eight and a half million viewers watching live online as it happened. Um, for comparison, uh, that's just slightly more than the 2013 Stanley Cup hockey finals. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the, the domain we're talking about. And, and in fact, overall, if you count all the people who watched this, uh, both live and, and uh, afterwards online, it was, it was about 32 million viewers overall for this event. So for those of you who don't know what League of Legends is, the way I like to think of it is as chess plus basketball plus Pokemon. <laughs> um, like chess, League is at heart a strategy game. So it's a top-down game where players control heroes that move around the map, a little bit like pieces moving around a board. And this is a game of combinations and exchanges, ploys and counterploys, a game of positional advantage, territorial control, a cerebral game of deep reading and calculated decisions. But, like basketball, League is also an action game, a real-time game of precision, timing, and flow, a, a game that allows for an enormous degree of player skill. And, like basketball, it is a team-based game. Uh, it's a five-on-five -five game that demands complex coordination between players. The League is a game of fast breaks, big confrontations, breathtaking skill shots, dramatic comebacks, an intricate ballet of split-second moves and counter moves that hap happen faster than the speed of thought. And then, like Pokemon, uh, this is a, a Baroque game, right? This is a, it's a game with layers upon layers of arcane knowledge that needs to be mastered before any of it makes sense. It's a game that wears its complexity on its sleeve. There are over a hundred different heroes, each with its own unique moves and different ranges and effects. There are hundreds of items that players can recombine in complex combinations to modify their abilities and attributes. And all of this kind of interacts with each other in essential ways to magnify or counteract the player's effectiveness. Now, surprisingly, unlike basketball, League of Legends actually doesn't have a single designer or inventor. The League is one of a couple of games uh, that are in this genre, which are called MOBAs for multiplayer online battle arenas, which are, are really just variants of a game called Dota, which wasn't a professionally created video game at all. It was a player-created mod of the game Warcraft 3. 
Dota evolved over many years with different modders and map makers coding variations and adding ideas. So one remarkable thing about this game is that even as we are still grappling with this new idea of video games as authored works, here we have this world-conquering masterpiece without any clear author. It was created out of a kind of internet-based folk culture. And I honestly do think that this game is a kind of a masterpiece. It's a game of unfathomably complex strategic richness. A game that combines careful thinking and precise execution, individual skill and collaborative decision making to produce moments of heart-stopping drama and mind-boggling depth. And it's remarkable how popular this game has become. It's not an exaggeration to say that this game and all its variations serves the role that baseball once did as a, as a kind of a universal play ritual for a whole generation of young Americans. And, and one of the things that makes this remarkable is how hard this game is to play. I mean, it's almost unplayable, right? There is nothing here but hard work, difficult decisions, learning, practice, sacrifice, struggle, constant failure, and occasional success. And this is not the easy escapism of adolescent power fantasies or the compulsive reward loops of digital Skinner boxes. This is an activity that demands focused attention and dedicated effort and draws from the ancient wellspring of stylized conflict, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. But it's also not the primal pleasures of physical activity, of running, jumping, throwing, catching, flipping. This is a game of thinking, right? Thinking and acting refracted through the densest network of intersecting forces that software can produce. To not sense bridge swept this country and became the beloved hobby of basically every adult, has there been a game that requires this much cognitive effort to unlock its beauty that has become this popular. It's as if I told you that this thing your kids are addicted to, this thing that looks like a violent, garish cartoon, is in fact a way of solving calculus equations for fun. If nothing else, we should all marvel at this demonstration that as a species, we are not always engaged in a race to the bottom. That sometimes, as a culture, en masse, we demonstrate a ravenous appetite for difficult, challenging works of great complexity and depth. So, that's League of Legends. It's the biggest game in the esports explosion. And alongside League, you have Dota 2, the rival MOBA, which is basically Pepsi to League's Coke. And um, Dota 2 is made by Valve. Uh, Valve's former chief economist is now the finance minister of Greece. So, you know, Draw your own games for change you can, conclusions from that fact. Um, so another key game in the esports universe is StarCraft. StarCraft is a real-time strategy game, which means that it's much closer to chess or to a kind of mutant hyperspeed chess. There's two players, head-to-head. -head, they're building structures that produce units and then controlling those units in tactical skirmishes or massive all-out battles. And StarCraft is especially important as the game that first demonstrated the massive potential of esports by becoming basically the national game of South Korea. So starting the late 90s, StarCraft became this massive phenomenon there with professional players that are followed like pop idols and have lucrative sponsorship deals, massive live tournaments, and multiple television channels devoted to showing games and analysis. StarCraft is a bizarre and beautiful game. It operates at the limits of human capability. I mean, top StarCraft players combine deep strategic analysis with virtuosic technical skill. I mean, just watching StarCraft and games like it is hard. It actually requires a surprising amount of literacy and focus and effort. It was in following professional StarCraft that I first discovered one of the greatest pleasures of esports, which is that this is a domain in which America is an underdog. There isn't a single major esport in which Americans are seriously competitive. And it's kind of great because, you know, we invented video games, but apparently we're just not that good at playing them. <laughs> and uh, in StarCraft, all non-Korean players are referred to as foreigners. 
I mean, everyone refers to them this way. Even American fans refer to American StarCraft pros as foreigners, which is, I think, kind of awesome. I just love that. Um, by the way, this is Scarlett, who, until she quit a few months ago, was the top American StarCraft player and just a brilliant, gifted player. Getting to see Scarlett uh, play live last year was one of the highlights of my eSport life. Um, so, after League and Dota, the, the MOBAs, and StarCraft, the RTS, the next big game in eSports is Counter-Strike, the first-person shooter, which we just heard Adrian talk about. So I'm going to join that conversation uh, and talk about ways in which I think Counter-Strike is uh, intensely social, right? Uh, the current version of StarCraft, uh, of Counter-Strike, rather, is called CSGO, uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Now, this is another game that has... Uh, its roots in player-created mods. So this game started as a mod of the game Half-Life, and uh, it's important to recognize how much esports owes to the tradition of openness by commercial developers like Valve and Blizzard and id, who not only allowed players to mess with their games, but actually encouraged it by making and distributing free tools that supported player experimentation and creativity. So major shout out to those guys for that. Counter-Strike is another team game. It's another five-on-five five, uh, team-based game. And it's also another game that is incredibly difficult and unforgiving. So a single shot can take you out completely. And once you're out of uh, a game of Counter-Strike, you're out for the entire round. So you don't instantly respawn. You have to wait and you rejoin the game in the next round. And it's played in a series of rounds. Now, this combination of lethal damage and no respawns leads to a game that is as much about accurate prediction and strategic positioning and territorial control as it is about aiming. I was, that's actually not, that's not quite right. I think it's more accurate to say that it's a game of deep, complex, kind of conscious decision making that actually sort of sits on top of this incredibly difficult and challenging skill-based game of aiming and shooting. And one thing I want to point out to you uh, as you watch this is um, the brightly colored weapons. Uh, that the players are using. So um, you see, uh, you'll see sometimes these guns that are bright red or bright orange, they have these kind of garish uh, patterns on them, uh, stripes and, and colors. And these are called skins. What they do is they, they, they allow the players to customize their weapons as a form of personal expression. And I think it's quite funny because you get this weird combination of gun fetishism, which is about this like super hyper-realistic weaponry. But at the same time, these guns are turning into sort of abstract pieces of sporting equipment. They look nothing like real world guns. They're like tennis rackets or electric guitars. And this tension kind of runs throughout Counter-Strike because what's going on in this game? Like, what does this mean? What is, what is the political meaning of this game? I mean, obviously one team is the terrorists and the other team is the counter-terrorists. The thing you have to understand is that a match consists of playing both. You play a bunch of rounds as one side, and then you switch, and you play as the other side. So there's some key differences in, in the weapons and, and the objectives, but the two sides are, for the most part, completely symmetrical. A and I honestly don't know quite how to think about the political meanings of this game. I mean, here we have the figure of the terrorist, which is the iconic, mythic villain of contemporary geopolitics. And for a generation of gamers, the most prominent pop cultural expression of this icon is a game in which terrorist is not a thing that you fight against. It's a thing that you are exactly half of the time. In this game, terrorist and counter-terrorist are not just abstracted to the status of cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians, but completely dissolved down to the status of black and white in chess. So how does a game like this interact with ideology? Does it reinforce it? Does it dissolve it? Is it just the ghostly afterimage of ideology burned into our retinas, glowing there long after we've closed our eyes? Is this art about war? Or is it just a form of virtual war, a tiny war reduced to its essence and stuck in a Klein bottle like a terrible genie trapped in an endless loop? So I kind of want to pitch Vice Media on a long form piece where I travel to the Middle East in search of the best Counter-Strike players. And I find out if there's a Palestinian Counter-Strike scene and see what those players think about this question. So if there's anyone from Vice Media, hit me up afterwards.
By the way, I should mention that CSGO has by far the most developed female competitive scene in esports with many serious female teams and women only tournaments. And also, just a quick shout out to my favorite esports subculture, which is Counter Strike Surfing. See, it turns out that the physics engine in Counter Strike has these properties that make it so that you can move across angled surfaces in a way that preserves your momentum. And players started making maps where this is all you did. Just linking together these swooping jumps and slides into seamless paths through these abstract 3D spaces. No weapons, no killing, just surfing. It's still technically challenging and highly skillful, but the whole experience has been transformed into this very peaceful, very chill activity. So I give you the first hippie esport. These players have, have, have beat their swords into surfboards. And maybe, if we're lucky, ladies and gentlemen, the future of war. other big games in esports. Uh, there's Hearthstone, uh, which is Blizzard's digital collectible card game, and good for Blizzard for finally kind of like having a breakout hit in a world where this entire genre is dominated by games that they were sort of responsible for but owned none of. Um, so this game has come out and, and just been, a, been an amazing uh, success and, and, uh, and, and garnered a huge amount of uh, momentum in serious play. It's kind of a uh, watered down, or not, it's, it's Magic the Gathering for babies, which turns out to be a great game, right? It turns out that Magic the Gathering, like simplified and streamlined, is actually a brilliant game, and it's played uh, at a very high level of competition. And of course, there are also fighting games, uh, like Street Fighter pictured here, which are still kind of the undomesticated underground of competitive gaming. These are kind of like the, the punk rock of esports. And together, these are the important games in the scene. So there are, there are a lot of factors that have allowed this scene to emerge. I think one of them is the games themselves, uh, the way that they've had time to develop and evolve and build large, highly literate communities around them. And another is just bandwidth, streaming, right? It's the fact that we can now watch high resolution video games streaming in real time. And, and the new culture of streaming on places like Twitch and YouTube, which have created brand new audiences with new kinds of viewing habits. And also the quality of the presentation has gotten extremely good with very entertaining professional level commentary and analysis. And I think overall there are a few really important and related things that are going on here. I think one of them is something that I like to think of as the return of the real in the form of reclaiming consequence, reclaiming the unique and unrepeatable quality of experience. A, a quality that is drained out of many single player video games by their endlessly plastic, synthetic, pliant form. So most video games place you in simulated conflicts and then let you try over and over again until you emerge victorious, which is nice. It's nice to keep thrashing away at a problem and know that you're guaranteed to eventually overcome it. But this endlessly elastic version of experience can sometimes feel cloying, clammy, a kind of a, a rubbery toy version of reality. In esports, every match is made up of unique and irreplaceable moments. Mistakes are real and permanent, and you're put into situations where you get one chance and one chance only. Every outcome is etched forever in the record book, and many of them are terrible moments of rage and despair. But each one of them has the sharp outline of a real thing that can't be changed and can't be forgotten. Every moment matters. Putting yourself into this type of experience is a way of participating in a kind of ritual. A ritual in which you both look inward to discover certain values, certain qualities of character, and project outward, performing these qualities, a kind of stylized demonstration of these values. These are the values that the uh, ancient Greeks, for whom sport was a sacred ritual, called erete which means the virtues of courage, of excellence, uh, the quality of fulfilling one's fate, living up to one's full potential. The sociologist Irving Goffman 
called this kind of play dangerous play. And he talked about how play of this kind gives us an opportunity to express and perform and celebrate certain qualities of character, qualities like determination, integrity, composure, self-confidence, self-control. There's also a potential for a pr profoundly deep social connection that exists in all sports, including esports. Not only because these games are about communities and traditions and public events and shared experiences, but also because high-level competition requires a strange kind of intimacy, a deep empathy of mirrored thought and action. So behind the often hostile culture, the macho bullshit posturing, the toxic aggression, there is the capacity to transform conflict and competition into something transcendent. And to return to basketball for a moment, let me quote from the great Bill Russell talking about this capacity. Every so often, a Celtic game would heat up so that it became more than a physical or even mental game, and it would be magical. To me, the key was that both teams had to be playing at their peaks, and they had to be competitive. The Celtics could not do it alone. I'd find myself thinking, this is it. I want this to keep going. And I'd actually be rooting for the other team. When their players made spectacular moves, I wanted their shots to go in the bucket. That's how pumped up I'd be. At that special level, all sorts of odd things happened. The game would be in a white heat of competition, and yet somehow I would not feel competitive. And I always felt then that I not only knew all the Celtics by heart, but also all the opposing players, and they knew me. There have been many times in my career when I felt moved or joyful, but these were the moments when I had chills pulsing up and down my spine. So the capacity for this kind of alchemical transformation of conflict into cooperation exists also, I believe, in esports and is perhaps the source of their greatest potential beauty. So, can video games played at the highest level of expertise for cheering crowds be an important cultural force for historical progress and political change? Can video games ever give us moments like Jesse Owen at the Berlin Olympics mocking Hitler's delusions of Aryan superiority? or Cassius Clay changing his name to Muhammad Ali and refusing to fight in Vietnam, or Catherine Switzer subjecting herself to physical attack just for being a woman who dared to run in the Boston Marathon, or the ping pong matches that led in the early 70s to the first diplomatic relations between the People's Republic of China and the United States. I think at the end of the day, what unites esports with the spirit of games for change is that they are both examples of the capacity for games to be more than just disposable entertainment. The capacity of games to engage with big ideas, not necessarily as a form of media, but as a powerful form of dramatic performance and shared ritual. While they are often compelling, these games are almost never fun. They are opportunities to encounter uncertainty to engage with complex challenges, to experience profound sacrifice, to participate in the difficult process of self-discipline and self-overcoming, to confront our limits and reveal our character, to celebrate shared values, and to transmute conflict into something strange and beautiful. Thanks.